Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have Ryan Johnson with us today, who's going to talk about how to achieve an exceptional milled restoration, uh, which sounds very exciting. And I am anxious to to see this. Well, Ryan is going to teach us uh, how to maximize uh, our CAD CAM strategies uh, to increase production, uh, manipulate the software to optimize your fit, and select digital applications and workflows to fit your needs. Um, so let me go ahead and turn this over to Ryan and let him get started. Okay, awesome. Thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks for uh, Paul setting everything up for me. Um, yeah, so today we're going to going to kind of go through uh, my process of creating uh, Suprinity milled restorations, and we'll kind of just go through the entire process here today. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my company is called OpenBite, uh, totally a digital company. So I, I do um, classes, also have a boutique dental lab, and um, also I'm a dealer for several CAD CAM companies. Uh, my info is just down below, and I'll show that again at the end as well for you guys. A uh, little bit about my background. Uh, I actually grew up uh, in a dental family. So my dad and my uncle were both dentists. And I actually uh, was uh, at my first time out of the hospital. My parents were still living ab above the dental office. Uh, I've been a dental technician since 2003, uh, starting out in more of the analog sense. So as a crown and bridge waxer, finisher, and then um, kind of took over doing full service stuff. Uh, once I moved to Milwaukee, uh, I, I actually did a master's program in dental biomaterials at Marquette School of Dentistry and also worked as a uh, in-house crown and bridge and, you know, full service technician at the dental school there in the graduate prosthodontics. And that really gave me a new perspective when I actually got to see the patients when I was working on the restorations for them. Uh, in addition to that, I've been a CAD CAM trainer and technical support uh, technician since 2008, starting with 3M back in their uh, Lava Digital days, and also continuing on through through then um, with some various other companies. I also have uh, been a product developer since then and have quite a few patents on digital workflows and materials as well. Uh, so for sure, if anyone has any questions on materials, I can take a stab at them uh, as we go through here. Uh, full disclosure, I do work with uh, several uh, digital companies in addition to Vita. Uh, you can see them here. These are our products I'm a distributor for. Um, a little bit of the caveat I would give is that I have no uh, you know, exclusivity within these companies. I work with them just simply because these are products I find give me the best results in, uh, in my experience. A um, little background on the partners. I've been working as an ExoCAD uh, trainer and reseller since 2011. So been with them since almost uh, the earliest days in the U.S. here. Uh, same with IMIS i -Core. And then um, with Vita as well, I've been working with them uh, as you know, a partner since 2021, but I actually uh, started using their products in 2003 and learned to do uh, ceramics using their uh, Omega 900 back in the day. Here's just a quick uh, overview of my little office here in downtown St. Paul. I host a lot of courses here on ExoCAD, um, you know, as well as uh, some of the traditional steps within it uh, down at my headquarters here. and. Uh, could actually see uh, my Vita rep Trish there in the corner and yep there's just a couple shots I have a few milling machines for my Messiah core as well here uh, so a bit of what we're gonna cover today is the design workflow uh, how to do the nesting and cam and how that can influence the fits uh, the milling uh, process, which we'll show a little bit of the uh, sped up video, and then we'll do some live on the characterization as well. So the case we're going to be working on today is this uh, number nine, which was a bit broken off and a little bit of a, you know, highly characterized tooth to try to blend in with the uh, surrounding teeth. So that was the, the pre-op scan. Here's kind of the pre-op photo that they took as well. 
And we'll start off doing some ExoCAD designs here. So if anyone's familiar with the ExoCAD software, this is gonna look pretty familiar. I've just got a digital impression here in the lower, so you can see that um, case that I've gotten in uh, from one of my accounts. I'm just gonna select the tooth, and in this case, I'm gonna do a full contour. If you guys are doing uh, veneering with like uh, the Lumex or the VM11 on Soprini, you can also do a coping with a cutback. Uh, I won't spend too much time on that today. We'll kind of focus on that in the uh, in a in a future class if people have interest in that. The next thing I'm going to do is pick my lithium silicate. I can choose the shade, adjust any of the fit thickness parameters, and whatnot there. So the next thing I'm going to do is get into my design here. Now, the next thing I do that I found works well for me and I've, I train most of my accounts on is also in uh, ExoCAD, when I'm dealing with uh, intraoral scans, I tend to find that the patient bites down lighter than they would in a traditional impression. So from what I found, if I correct the antagonist bite, I can minimize any of the adjustments I have in it. So I'll just show you exactly how I do that in, in how I train other labs as well. I'm gonna go into my expert mode. It'll just say I've got a slight contact. So I'll say, get rid of those. And then I'm gonna go right ahead and correct my antagonist. From what I've found, closing the bite to kind of do a virtual equilibration by 0.4 gives me really good results. So as you can see, I've got a slight intrusion there on parts of it. So when I click on my wizard now, it's gonna give me the message that I've now created uh, intersection. And I wanna go ahead and take out that as well. Like I said, what I found with this is that that really uh, helps within my uh, workflow to minimize those adjustments at the doctor level. Otherwise, I found a lot of times I would have it where it fit well on the model, but they would still say the bite was too high. So my assumption is that that's got to do something with the uh, periodontal ligament and their compression within the patient's mouth versus taking a traditional impression. Um, so with that, I've, I've just found that that helps me minimize in that sense. At this point, you can also go ahead and do the uh, virtual articulation as well if you want to use the dynamic bite function. And once I complete that, then you'll see that I've got dynamic uh, occlusion in my upper right-hand corner. So from here on out, I'll be able to go through the wizard. Those are kind of the two steps I'll do at the beginning of each case. Oops. Next, we'll just go through mark margin. I always use correct draw when I'm doing this, and I can use my control key if it ever doesn't want to follow on the margin. One tip I find as well is if you have accounts, it can be useful if they're doing any retraction cord to use a contrasting cord, just so you can see the margin a little bit easier. And I can make any fine tweak adjustments at this point as well. So right here, you can see that I've got my cement gap set at 0.8 and uh, just a millimeter off the margin. I generally will keep this setting the same for um, zirconia crowns, lithium silicate crowns, pretty much any of my uh, restorations I'm doing. I also, in general, keep my uh, horizontal and, uh, border at 0.1 and angled border at 0.2. 
Now, if you're using uh, different milling machines, this may vary a little bit, but with my equipment set up, this seems to be uh, good. And with those settings, I generally don't have to do um, any manual finishing around the margins. So now if you've seen it, it's automatically marked in uh, my mesial and distal contact teeth and auto-placed a tooth. And it also will adapt that tooth right now to where my, uh, to where my anatomic uh, is, is taking into account the occlusion. The main thing I find that makes a big difference in my cosmetics of the case and makes it a lot easier to get good results is to take advantage of the new tooth library section. And on a case like this, I generally find it's nice to move it up so I can see all of my teeth as I'm going through them. So I can kind of choose the tooth that has the same, same shape as what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, based on the, the surrounding dentition. One other feature that's kind of cool within the new uh, new version is they've kind of flattened the uh, um, interface so that now I can also use flat and pointed. A lot of people know that this is useful when they're doing posteriors to adjust the angulation, but will also adjust the age or the wear amounts on the teeth as well. So that's something I can play with to kind of optimize the look of my teeth. I think for me on this case, I'd probably go with something like this. And we'll start with uh, that as probably my proposal. Looks pretty good. Now you can see at this point, it's not really snapped to the margin. So I can use my control keys to alter that and adjust it. If I need to, to uh, make it larger, I also will use control shift and drag, drag the tooth. And it should respect my minimal thickness there as well. The main thing I use once I get to this step is I generally try to do as as little alterations as I can get away with. So my preferred method is to, to start with the anatomic morphing uh, as soon as I can. And in the latest version, the Rieka build, you can see that I've also got a uh, green signifying uh, where, where it's being influenced by what I'm adjusting. One other cool trick is if you're looking to, to make changes, like let's say I want to adjust down here, but I don't want to move my cusp tip. I can also grab onto those sections of the tooth as well. I'm just going to drag. Just to kind of make that similar in size ledge there. So I'll generally look down to make sure I've got a good adaptation along the entire tooth there. The other thing I'll do at this point is I also want to just check. I usually like to rotate my model so that I can see where my contact points will be. After that, I like to go into my freeforming step. And within the freeforming step, now you can see I've got a dynamic occlusion, a static occlusion. So since I have the articulator on, it will show me my dynamic occlusion. 
So that will take into account all of my excursive movements. In my uh, approximal or um, adjacent tooth contacts, what I like to do is open this up to get to more options. I just found that I can really minimize my adjustments by uh, taking a couple of uh, extra steps here. What I like to do is block out my adjacents. That'll create a straight line down from my path of insertion so that my crown will just drop right down when I finish it. The other part I like to do is, especially on intraoral scans, it's not able to differentiate what is the tissue from what is the tooth. So what I want to do is I want to do exclude selected parts and paint everything that's contacting soft tissue that I know can be moved. So now you'll see it's going to mark my my two adjacent teeth and give me that block out under the contact so I don't have any uh, cupped contact or, you know, that's engaging an undercut. You can also see here that now it's, it's not going to create those divots on where the tissue was impinging on my design. The last thing I'll do on this particular one, I've just got a little bit of uh, sharpness here. So I'm just going to smooth that off. And if I hold shift, it'll go a little faster. And we'll just make sure I've got everything adjusted there. And then just because on the RX, they specifically said they want to get a similar crack line. I'm just going to go ahead here and just add in a little bit there as well. And we can finalize that just a little bit once I get um, my milled restoration. Now, if I was doing this case uh, and I wanted a model, I would go into the model as well. But at this point, I'm pretty much done. If I wanted to make any uh, quick adjustments, I could do that as well. But uh, for the most part, that would be my entire process on a case like this. So once I'm completed with this, I would just hit copy and I would put the case into my CAM file. Uh, so here I'll show you guys just uh, the uh, CAM workflow. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the machine I have. Obviously, I'm going to do the lithium silicate. In this particular machine, I also have the holder that holds uh, six of the blocks in. So I'm going to pick which position I have the blocks in. I'm going to tell it I have an anatomic crown. And there you can see just the, uh, the crown I've designed here. So now it's going to give me the option. I've got the, the Vita blocks all programmed in. And it's going to auto nest it for me. I generally will use a, a pin diameter 2.3 at the crown and 3 at the material. For me, that kind of gives me the minimum space I can, uh, you know, have the smallest screw connector possible without ever uh, having it uh, break off. And for me, that's kind of in the sweet spot I found. Um, I've also turned it red, which indicates I'm going to have the machine uh, cut like 60% of it off. So that then it's just a very thin connector. Um, so the last step after it's milled the entire crown, it's just going to cut the connector for me. From here, I can just save the tool path. You can see I can also adjust um, the, the angulation uh, direction. Uh, since this is being done on a five axis machi machine, 
Uh, I don't have to really respect the uh, insertion direction like I would on a four axis machine. So this kind of allows me to also uh, get a better anatomy on the, the, um, the facial and the lingual in addition, uh, just because I'm not having to be constrained by the uh, insertion direction on my prep. Let's we'll skip ahead a sec here. So it's just going to calculate up my job here. Um, I've chosen to do it with uh, with a 0.6 tool on both the inside and outside of that. And I'll just show you real quick while we're waiting for that to uh, fire up here. So this is kind of uh, what I'm going to end up with after I've milled everything. You can see here kind of the, the thin connector that I've ended up with. Okay, so the next thing I've got, once I've got my job all calculated, I'm just going to go ahead and put the block in my milling machine. And that will show me uh, my tool life for the tools I've got ready to go on the, on the mill. Um, in this case, I'm using a machine model called the Coratech One Plus. So it's got uh, the built-in water tank, which is uh, behind that black screen down at the bottom. Uh, it's important, obviously, with milling uh, the glass ceramics, like the Suprinity, to uh, have adequate coolant just to make sure it doesn't break at any point here. Okay, okay so... From here, I'm just going to show a really sped up uh, like 10x uh, milling step. So you'll see here what it's first going to do is grab the 2.5 millimeter tool and rough it. What it's going to be doing in this step is kind of tracing the outline. So it'll use the full tool depth to trace the outline of my crown. Um, so it'll just basically be straight up and down in the shape of the crown. Second step is going to use that same tool and go over the, the top and inside the crown uh, in a back and forth manner. So this will kind of rough out the, uh, the shape of the crown in 3D rather than just the 2D outline. Now it's going to do the inside of the cavity. You can see here because it was a off-center the way I put it. That's using the fifth axis there just to uh, adjust into the crown there. It's going to do the same exact thing on the top with this tool. Uh, so this will get us pretty close to the net shape. Um, now, if I chose to do this and I, I was like constrained on time, like let's say it's a, it's a chair side and time is of the essence, it's not a super detailed case, I could use the less tools and steps as well and just uh, cut off a bit of the time. In this case, uh, in generally, um, since I'm in a lab, I'm not uh, as concerned with the amount of time it takes. Uh, I believe this job was 28 minutes to use the, the highest detailed. Um, and that just kind of depends on the uh, size of the crown, where I position it, and uh, you know, just uh, some of those factors. I've, al I've also found that it saves quite a bit of time if I do six blocks all at once because it will um, not have as much time changing the tools and checking them. On this particular machine, it has that uh, tool sensor, which it taps down to measure the tool. Uh, and then it just checks to make sure that it's um, taking the tool out of the collet. Uh, this allows it to have a bit more um, a bit more of uh, the fine details versus uh, having a machine that does not have a tool change. And that's just because if I have a, if I have a machine without the tool change function, it's going to have to try to make some compromises on what can it get the detail in versus what can it get uh, done quickly with. And using a hard material like the lithium silicate, it can also uh, it can also be a bit um, harder on tools, causing them to flex. So by using a large tool first to remove the bulk of the material, I'm able to get a much better fit on the inside when I do go in with the fine uh, fine tools. Right now it's using kind of like the, uh, the main finishing, which is the one millimeter. Now it's gonna grab the really small 0.6 taper tool. And from there, it's gonna do anything that it missed on the first step. And there you can see I've got my crown uh, cut out and uh, ready to go. 
so you can kind of see a couple photos of uh, the before and after. And there you can see the fit as well, just straight out of the mill. One of the things I really like with the Supremity product is it's got a bit of a finer grain structure due to its composition. What I found is that that uh, enables me to get extremely good marginal integrity when I'm milling it. So I've got a, a bunch of lab friends that I've, I've kind of told I'm milling all these cases and uh, they were... Most of them were a bit skeptical that you could get similar results to pressing, uh, but I don't think any of them that I've, that I've done work for have have uh, not been impressed with the fit level that you can get with this this particular product. And I really think it comes down to a couple factors, which would be uh, your mill and your milling strategy and the quality of tools you're using and also the material itself. And in this case, the Vita um, Sprinty is, is excellent uh, because of that finer grain structure. Okay, so when I get the, the crowns out of my, uh, switch here. When I get the crowns out of the mill, they're gonna look just like this. Now, since I've done the partial cut, I would just take this off and uh, I would generally just use a, a diamond burr and take down that sprue and then typically i would also if i wanted to accentuate any of the the lines i would use a diamond as well the main thing i want to hey, avoid hey ryan work. yep can i uh sorry to interrupt you but um i want to back up a little bit to the milling i've got a question here oh, um sure. Uh, do, you, do you find uh, a better milling using a single spindle machine uh, as compared to uh, the chair side pipe uh, like the Ceric, you know, that has the, the double? Um, I would say I do. The main, the main differences between the two types of technology are the Ceric mill typically does the entire uh, top surface with one tool and the entire bottom surface with one tool. So with using the single spindle machine that has a more complex tool changing system, you're able to uh, go kind of large to small with your milling sequence. And also when you're milling, uh, most of the double spindle machines are only a three axis machine. So you're not able to get any uh, details on like the facial surface like you would with a five axis machine. Does that answer it? Okay. So this is what it looks like then in the uh, kind of pre-crystallized state. Now for me, generally, I've just done a, a bit of quick, uh, just a quick uh, once over with the with the tool. And that's what I'm gonna do, assuming this was uh, totally done. I'm just gonna go ahead and add in some of the, the firing paste. And then typically I will at this point Just go over it with a real thin coat of the glaze. And obviously I would take off that as well. I just don't have my handpiece out in uh, this room here. I don't want to run away and leave you guys here. So once I have this, then I can go ahead and I use the uh, combi firing. So I'll use the paste and the... Uh, uh, crystallization. I believe it's around 21 minutes in the uh, in the oven to do that, and that will allow me to kind of get a nice canvas to start on my next phase of the process. So once I've got that, what I'm going to end up with post crystallization is something that looks just like this. So you can see here, I've got a kind of nice uh, starting point. It's not super polished or super um, 
super glossy, but I've got a nice uh, palette to kind of start adding, adding my characterization. Now for me, I generally try to uh, simplify a lot of my uh, cases. And I found with this, this product, I can get really awesome results with pretty minimal um, amounts of effort. But I do find that uh, using just a couple simple stain techniques, I can really make the crown pop a bit more than, than just the uh, basic shade match. So what I will typically do when I'm doing a crown, in this case, what I've done is I've set up a couple stains here. So I'm gonna usually use uh, whatever the, the chroma stain that corresponds with what I'm trying to achieve. So in this case, uh, the the, the customer's wanting a C3 to a C2 fade. Um, I've also got that crack there. So generally my, uh, my technique is to do that crack also in the main chroma stain that the crown is in. In addition to that, I have a few of my uh, go-to favorites I use. I really like this ESO5, which is kind of the orangish hue. Now, in any types of wear facets, uh, I find that really useful. I also like it on a lot of the cervicals. If I've got staining that is beyond uh, just the, the chroma of the case. And the next one I like is the ES12. This is kind of the gray blue. And I love using that for um, my translucent effects. Of course, I got the Glaze LT that I use. And then also the ESO1, which is a little tough to see in the corner here. And that's my white effect here. Of course, they have the you know entire stain wheel. So um, if I want to get really crazy, I can, can go with some of those too. But generally, if I'm just trying to show people the uh, techniques I would get to for a simple you know, two-bake crown, that's kind of what I would go with as uh, my recommendations. Keep it simple. Okay, and I'll, I'll exaggerate this a little bit. Uh, I'll probably be a little heavy-handed just because the visualizer doesn't quite uh, quite show up uh, the effects as well as uh, in person. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab a little bit, and I use I like to use pretty small brushes. This one's a point uh, zero zero three. Because I've scored that particular part, my paste will kind of um, gravitate towards that uh, crack line that the, the customer was looking to replicate from number eight there. And I'll just show you real quick. I've got kind of a, one that I've just drawn on with some colored pencil here. So for me, what I like to do is a bit of like an M shape almost to get my uh, translucency. So you can see here in the blue, that's where I would use kind of my ES12. I've got my dark uh, brown line where the crack line is, and that's where I'm going to use the C shade. I'm going to use a combination of the C and a bit of the ES05 orange around the cervical. I'm going to do the same up through here uh, on the neckline there to kind of get that effect showing through. Then I'm going to also use the ES5 on my lingual there and in this incisal edge. And finally, I'm going to use the white highlights of the ES1 uh, up around kind of the halo there and streak a bit on the on the crown itself. So I've got my uh, my C shade there. I'll try to accentuate it a little bit so you guys can see here. So I've got that going through that crack there. I use a slightly larger brush and dilute it a bit, and then I'll do that on my gingiva here.
And I'm also going to use a little bit of the five. And I find if I mix those two together, it'll kind of give me a good uh, effect here of the CEJ. And I'm going to do the same here. I kind of paint this as a little bit of a, a triangular shape where I'll go over it with the orange and then come back and hit it with the, the C and kind of fade those two together. So I'm trying to be a little little subtle with that to get that effect. I can always go back and add more uh, later on as well if if I want to do another bake. I'll use a pretty dilute amount then to just kind of go along that edge there where that's where I mimic that wear uh, in my CAD design. There again, I'll kind of also blend in some of this C. And the same in the single them there. Uh, next, I'm going to do my, my, uh, Mamelon slash uh, incisal translucency. So I'm going to start and kind of go diffuse. With my ES12 here along the edge, bringing it down a little bit deeper. There. Now I'll use my small brush again to bring it up kind of in that wedge shape. One thing I like about the accent product too uh, on this is once I've done my crystallization, I can also see kind of what I'm gonna end up with on my final. It gives me a good uh, representation of the color. And you can use this in either the, the uh, powder or liquid form, uh, or paste form rather. So I just want to kind of get that effect uh, that I want. The last one I'm going to do is use just a little bit of the white here. And sometimes I'll dilute this out if it's a little too extreme. But I oftentimes like to also break up the light a little bit with like some fade. Mimic maybe some slight craze lines. Obviously it depends on surrounding dentition. And then I will just kind of tap a few spots around around the ESO5 and the C uh, chroma in that incisal edge. One thing I like to use as well at this point is I've been using a lot of this uh, Vita Accent Floor Glaze Spray. Now, uh, the Supreme should have a natural uh, fluorescence of its own. But uh, zirconia, this one's really helpful. And I also like this because it won't smudge when I'm ending up with this, uh, when I've already characterized. So I can kind of get a little bit uh, extra glaze bake on this. And usually I save a bake doing that. So I can just spray this right on top of what I've got. Um, the one thing to note is you'll get a little bit of a feel for it. Um, generally, if it was a dry crown, I could see uh, the powder drying on this. In this case, because I already have the paste below it, I won't really see that effect. But um, it will make a difference once I actually end up staining and glazing it. Also, this will add like a nice fluorescence. Like I said, if this was a zirconia versus a serenity, um, that really helps, uh, you know, make it more uh, natural when you get into the, the, the light conditions. And like I said, one of the things I really like with that is it won't really uh, smudge what I've got going on on the rest of the case. 
So with the magic of a TV cooking show here, um, you can see that's kind of the effect that I've got then. So I do that exact same thing and have fired the case. I'll show you a couple of the, the photos of that crown uh, here just in uh, in the regular regular sense. Now, a couple of the other things I like to use on the crown um, as far as finishing, Vita has this pretty cool Supreme polishing kit. So one nice thing about this versus uh, Zirconia, um, if you're looking for kind of a quicker crown, is that this can be polished and it blends much more than the Zirconia. It tends to get kind of a, a pearl-like appearance where if I polish the Zirconia, you see a bit of a finish line. With the Supreme, it's not going to have any of that um, delineation between that. They've got a couple of uh, you know different shapes and a, a fine and a coarse. Now, I know it's not listed as being one of the items for it, but the other one I like to use on these are they have a red and a gray wheel that are actually part of their Enamic kit. Um, this is probably one of the tools I use the most when I'm uh, doing these, just because it's a little spiral one especially. Uh, you can get into your uh, occluso grooves and things like that. There are, of course, uh, other products that, that work with that, but I found that one's uh, pretty nice as well. So when I'm done with uh, this case, then I would just put this in the oven. I generally run this on my regular glaze cycle, so it's uh, around 12 minutes at 800 C that I'll, that I'll fire that for every subsequent bake. Are there any questions on uh, that section at all? No, it looks good so far. Uh, the only question I had was uh, when you're using that uh, spray glaze, uh, yeah. do you got any recommendations for that to keep it from coming out, um, you know, too dry or, or, or anything like that? It, I feel like it's kind of tricky. Uh, it's a little tricky. I like to make sure that I'm at a distance where kind of the larger chunks won't won't get onto it. So a lot of times I'll test kind of my hand and see if it's, you know, how thick it's coming out. And I don't know if you can see that. Got kind of a thin powder. Um, sometimes I find, too, a lot of times I'll take that little tip off. Um and or clean it between uses and that's just because i found that that uh, little straw type thing that comes with it tends to uh dry out the powder so you end up with more kind of chunks coming through okay awesome thank you cool um yeah so i'll jump back to the other section i'll just show you a couple of the a couple of the other slides here so this is just, uh, hopefully you can see, uh, that's just kind of what I was showing before here, uh, where I was using uh, the application of the other um, colors. So I'm going to try to get uh, down in the grooves a little bit. And what I like to do is kind of feather along the edges there uh, with the blue. I'm going to use my C and my orange in the incisal. And there you can see kind of like once I finish that bake that I did. Um, so I've, on this case, I've done basically a crystallization uh, with the uh, with the uh, glaze and and then um, just on my application, my stain after. In this case, I think I also did one bake just because I was trying to get a very dark C. I think I just uh, streaked through that groove as well um, when I was doing it. So here you can see kind of uh, the effects that I, I got. You can see in here as well, kind of that uh, incisal edge. Uh, I found that that, um, when I have a thin incisal edge with uh, kind of that wear facet out the occlusion or the incisal, um, that it also kind of helps break up the light. So when you see it, it's a little bit uh, more interesting uh, as far as how it refracts the light through through the case. So in this case, uh, you know, kind of the, the technique I would use is, 
towards that, I would just uh, have, have my crown out, obviously, um, fits down. But you can actually uh, use all the stains when you're in the, the kind of, I want to say green state, but it's actually kind of purple, depending on the blocks. Uh, I think they're kind of kind of cool looking to me. They look a little bit like Jolly Ranchers. Um, but yeah, you can end up doing um, any of the stains if you're if you're happy with that. One nice thing with this material too is it's pretty easy to um, to go ahead and just uh, polish off if I want to decrease it. So I can go a little heavy handed at this point and then decrease with just the uh, the polishing wheels as well. So that's typically what I would do, and then. Uh, go ahead and crystallize it with some of the minor effects. So I can kind of almost, um, if it makes sense, use a uh, fixation firing when I'm doing it. And then I will go back and do my adjustments after I've crystallized it. Now, if you're kind of new to that uh, process, I would probably just uh, take an extra bake and crystallize it first, just because it's much easier to see what's happening than if I'm working on something that's... Uh, relatively um, uh, transparent here. Uh, the only thing you might have to do as well, like on this case, I did adjust a little bit on the tissue of my model just because the tissue was flapped over a little bit that wasn't ditched on it. In general, I've been doing just solid models with removable dyes, and that seems to get me a, a good result on, on that. So all these cases that I'm showing here, I didn't do any uh, adjustments on the contacts or anything like that. No, no taking the margins in. That was just kind of straight out of the milling machine. And that can, uh, you know, that can obviously be uh, be affected by how you design and also, um, you know, just the the mill that you're using. And of course, hey, the hey, Ryan. Uh, material. Yep. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about the the marginal integrity of the Supernity um, compared to Emacs? Yeah, yeah, I touched on it briefly. One of the things I've noticed with it, I don't know if the the picture quality is super good here. One of the things I I can see when I'm under a scope is that when I'm using that point six tool, it's able to get into very fine details here and. That allows me to get a uh, great marginal integrity from the milling side. The other thing is that uh, the lithium disilicate, like the Emacs product, uh, has kind of, a, if you looked at it under a SEM, scanning electron microscope, you know, very high power, uh, that it's actually got a grain structure with uh, what they, I think, refer to as needle, needle-like, uh, you know, crystals. And those needle-like crystals uh tend to to be uh you know long kind of crystals and so it's a little bit trickier because most milling machines when you're milling it will tend to kind of remove the material along those crystalline lines as it's grinding so from my experience you get a bit more chipping and or if you looked at it at a microscopic level you just wouldn't end up with the extremely clean line like i've seen on the superinity products uh, let me see here too paul i'll see if i can grab a tool real quick to show you yeah and one of the other things of that com uh comparing the two is that um at temperature when you're firing it the uh, the margin on the suprinity um, is a oh, lot sorry, more okay. I said that oh. I was just saying that that when you're firing uh, the two the the margin is going to stay a lot more stable uh, because at at the high temperature that um, on the emacs they require you to fill up that entire um, uh, cavity all the way up to the margin line with their putty material because yeah. they use it as an because they use it as an insulator um, at the margin because uh, Emacs tends to melt or roll over at the margin where ours doesn't that you don't want to yeah. fill up that cavity with the paste you only want to put in enough to hold it on the pin that ours is much more stable so you get a much better fit yeah and that's where I found it was nice I can usually just 
you know, fixation it. Um, I generally make sure that it's not touching, but I don't know that I've ever had an effect of it, you know, warping or anything like that. Um, and then you can see too, like you were talking about, this is, you know, unretouched or fitted or anything like that, but you can see there's a an exact fit uh, the same uh, prior to firing. And I haven't really noticed, uh, and maybe you can speak to it too, Paul. I haven't really noticed any uh, dimensional changes, even if I fired it, you know, quite a few times. So it really makes it uh, pretty user friendly. Uh, no, you're right. And even the tests they, they've done, I think they show it after four firings, it's still being, um, you know, very dimensionally stable, even at the margins. Yeah. I don't know that I've uh, gotten that high as the number of firings, but you know, there's a chance. But it's nice to know that it's not gonna, it's not gonna affect it. You're not uh, wondering if should I, should I, you know, try to get it to look a uh, good characterization. Um, so, so here's kind of what I was saying. Uh, you can get a sense for the, uh, the size of the tool I was using to do my margins and also my uh, cavity there. Uh, in relation, that's a it's about the size of the uh, number one brush here. There's a double zero. So that really allows you to get uh, super fine details. So if you ever have a, I know no one here ever gets it, but if you ever had a case that didn't have, a, you know, ideal uh, smooth margin lines uh, at the, uh, you know, nice shoulder slash chamfer, you can still get away with it on the Supreme, whereas um, you might be kind of compromising. Or um, one of the things I always avoid too is having to do uh, back in the day with uh, some of the other products, I would have to do kind of a a final sealing when I would do my final bake just to get the margin closed. And with this product, generally I trust it, you know, straight from the mill through all the firings to to my final uh, seeding. All right, any any other questions on the board there? Uh, looks good so far. Okay, cool. So, just got a couple things. So yeah, like I said, that's that's the basic um, you know, final final process here. Uh, last thing I'll just kind of mention uh, to you guys is, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out with me uh, on my email uh, and also my phone number's up there. So feel free to uh, get in touch. Uh, if you're, if you have questions on any of the products I showed or, you know, any of the things. Uh, I also just a uh, quick plug. Uh, I'll have some upcoming courses uh, at my office here, and some of those uh, topics will be like a, a kind of a hands-on of what we cover today through the whole process, and I'll probably also show a bit, um, you know, even how you could add to this. I've been using the Lumex on any cutbacks or micro veneering, uh, so this product uh, can be used in layered applications, although I think it works pretty great uh, as a monolithic as well. Uh, I also have a, a bunch of ExoCAD courses, so I have a two-day ExoCAD coming up next week, uh, and also a, a Smile Creator Advanced Aesthetics course, uh, where we'll show a bunch of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the smile design, the uh, milling, the finalization, characterization, uh, photography, all of those uh, parts, and then, uh, uh, you know, some advanced implants, uh, including like bars. Uh, I just did a case that we'll, we'll show how to do in that case. And in that course also for a locator bar with uh, the Vita dentures over the top. So, um, you know, if you just wanna hit my website at openbite.dental, uh, that will uh, have info on some of the upcoming courses as well. Uh, one final thing that I think we discussed, Paul, but if anyone out there is interested, uh, if they shoot me an email, I can also set you guys up to um, 
to mill one of your cases if you have a design i'd be uh, happy to mill it in superinity for you just be in be in touch with me and i can help you set up all the uh the parameters and uh get you set up on how to get to me on that so we also have several um uh, webinars coming up uh digital materials denture teeth uh ceramics uh we have dr t speaking uh some pressing stuff uh vigo denture teeth so depending on what you guys want or want to see we've got a bunch of stuff here as well um so you can check our site at, um you can check ryan's uh site to see what um he's got coming up um if you guys have any questions about uh, the products and pricing and stuff, this will get you pretty close. I apologize, this slide is a little old and a couple of those reps uh, are have changed, but I don't have an updated one yet. So if you don't see a rep up there, call me and I can get you the right person. Um, and then if you've got any technical questions, um, if you can't get a hold of Ryan, uh, then you're welcome to reach out to Jim or myself here at the help desk at Vita. I got a few comments here that uh, there's several people that are using the Suprinity on the IMAS i and like it quite a bit. So excellent, we're glad to hear that. Um, and again, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to Ryan or myself and we'll be happy to help you guys out. Thanks again so much for joining us today. Uh, do you have any last minute things, Ryan? Oh, uh, you know, yeah, for sure. Uh, glad to hear there's some uh, customers with the I'm a Psychor that like the the product. I probably know a couple of those folks. Uh, uh, but if anyone else has questions on uh, any digital products, including you know the Vita products, uh, you can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I, I provide kind of the complete solutions. And also, if you guys want to get in touch with me or Paul, if there are any topics that uh, you'd like to see us uh, work on together in the future, just let me know and we can uh, certainly uh, fit in the schedule for a future webinar. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Ryan, and thanks uh, the rest of you for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon.